Asia. These individuals in the NRA are charged with failing to manage the NRA's funds and failing to follow numerous state and federal laws, which contributed to the loss of more than $64 million in just three years. Since its founding in 1871, the NRA has been a registered not-for-profit charitable corporation in the state of New York. And these organizations are required by law to register and file annual financial reports with the Office of the New York State Attorney General. And the assets of such an organization are legally required to be used in a way that serves the interest of NRA membership and that advance the organization's charitable mission. However, as today complaints as today's complaints lays out, we found that the NRA instead fostered a culture of noncompliance and disregard for internal controls that led to the waste and loss of millions in assets and contributed to the NRA's current deteriorated financial state. Not only were the NRA's internal policies repeatedly not followed, but they were blatantly ignored by senior leaders. The NRA's board's uh, audit committee was negligent in its duty to ensure appropriate, competent, and judicious stewardship of assets by NRA leadership. Specifically, the audit committee failed to assure standard fiscal controls. They failed to respond adequately to whistleblowers, affirmatively took steps to conceal the nature and scope of whistleblower concerns from external auditors, and they failed to review potential conflicts of interest for employees. In our lawsuit, we outlined dozens of examples of these failures, many of which were led and perpetuated by the four individual defendants named in this lawsuit who failed to fulfill their fiduciary duty to the NRA. They used millions upon millions of dollars from the NRA for personal use, including for lavish trips for themselves and their families, private jets, expensive meals, and other private travel. Wayne LaPierre, Woody Phillips, Joshua Powell, and John Frazier instituted a culture of self-dealing, mismanagement, and negligent oversight at the NRA that was illegal, oppressive, and fraudulent. They overrode and they invaded, evaded internal controls to allow themselves their families and favored board members, employees and vendors to benefit through reimbursed expenses, related party transactions, excess compensation, side deals, and waste of charitable assets without regard to the NRA's best interest. The central figure behind this scheme was none other than Mr. Wayne LaPierre, the national face of the NRA, who was entrusted with running its day-to-day -day operations. Mr. LaPierre exploited the organization for his and his family's financial benefit and the benefit of a close, close circle of NRA staff, board members, and vendors. Specifically, Mr. LaPierre spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of the NRA's charitable assets for personal private plane trips for himself and his family, including extended family when he was not present. He visited the Bahamas by private air charter at least eight times in an approximate three year period with his family at a, co at a, at a cost of more than $500,000 to the NRA. He traveled on multiple luxury hunting safaris in Africa, 
at the expense of an NRA vendor. He spent millions of dollars on unwanted travel consultants for decades, including for the booking of luxury black car service. In the past two years alone, Mr. LaPierre spent more than $3.6 million on these travel agent services. He secured a post-employment contract for himself with the NRA without board approval, currently valued at more than $17 million. He allotted several million dollars annually in NRA funds for private security costs for himself and his family without sufficient oversight on their use. He received more than $1.2 million in reimbursement in just a four-year period for expenditures that included gifts for favored friends and vendors, travel expenses for himself and his family, and membership fees at golf clubs, hotels, and other member clubs. He even secured lucrative consulting contracts for ex-employees and board members worth millions of dollars. Yet often it resulted in little, if any, actual work. In addition to grossly misusing these funds for personal use, Mr. LaPierre created a, an illegal pass-through arrangement to conceal the very nature of these expenditures. For decades, Mr. LaPierre and the founder of Ackerman McQueen, the NRA's longtime advertising firm, had a practice whereby Ackerman McQueen would pay for these non-contractual, out-of-pocket expenses for, La, for Mr. LaPierre and other NRA executives and pass those expenses through to the NRA. These expenses would then be paid for by the NRA without written approval, without receipts, without any supporting business purpose documentation. Ackerman McQueen would aggregate the expenses into a lump sum amount and then bill them to the NRA without any details on the nature or purpose of the expense completely in violation of state law. These expenses did not comply with IRS requirements and as a result, all such expenses should have been included by the NRA in taxable personal income for Mr. LaPierre and other recipients. In 2017 and 2018 alone, just two years, Ackerman, Ackerman McQueen was paid more than $70 million. A significant amount of these funds included payments through this side agreement. And when board members challenged Mr. LaPierre and the three other defendants over this lavish spending, their financial governance or their leadership of the NRA, Mr. LaPierre retaliated and turned the board against those who attempted to challenge his illegal behavior. The complaint lays out numerous other instances in which Mr. LaPierre, Phillips, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Powell, and Mr. Frazier, and other executives and board members at the NRA abused their power and illegally diverted or facilitated the diversion of tens of millions of dollars from the NRA. These funds were in addition to millions of dollars the four individual defendants were already receiving in grossly excessive salaries and bonuses that were baseless and did not adhere to prudent standards for evaluating and determining compensation as is required by law. Altogether, there are 18 causes of action and these actions violated multiple laws, including the laws governing the NRA's charitable status false reporting on annual filings with my office and the IRS, improper expense documentation, improper wage reporting, improper income tax withholding, failure to make required excise tax reporting and payments, 
payments in excess of reasonable compensation to disqualified persons, and waste of NRA assets, amongst other offenses. For these years of fraud and misconduct, we are seeking an order to dissolve the NRA in its entirety, to require Mr. LaPierre, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Powell, and Mr. Frazier to make full restitution for funds they unlawfully profited and salaries they earned while employees, uh, while they earned while employees, and pay penalties. To remove Mr. LaPierre and Mr. Frazier from the NRA's leadership and to ensure none of the four, four individual defendants can ever again serve on the board of a charity in New York State. It's important to note that Mr. Phillips and Mr. Powell have left the NRA. It's clear that the NRA has been failing to carry out its stated mission for many, many years, and instead has operated as a breeding ground for greed, abuse, and brazen illegality. In this state, we have a set of laws that every individual and entity must be held accountable to, regardless of who you are, regardless of your power, size, influence, wealth, or station in life. One set of laws. And today, we send a strong and loud message that no one is above the law, not even the NRA one of the most powerful organizations in this country. Again, I'd like to thank the chief of the Charities Bureau, Jim Sheehan, and the co-chief of the enforcement section, Emily Stern. And they led with a dedicated and experienced and professional team of attorneys who I'm very proud to be associated with. Also a team of accountants, legal assistants, and they include Assistant Attorney General and Special Counsel of the Litigation Bureau, Monica Connell, Assistant Attorney General William Wong, Wang, Assistant Attorney General Sharon Sash, Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Conley, Assistant Attorney General Stephen Thompson, and Assistant Attorney General Erica James, all of the Charities Bureau, with additional assistance from Chief Accountant Judith Welsh Ebros, Assistant Associate Accountant Darren Bouchamp, and Associate Accountant Charles Aganu, in addition to numerous other individuals at the Office of Attorney General. The Charities Bureau is part of the Division for Social Justice which is supervised by Chief Deputy Attorney General Megan Fox and First Deputy Attorney General Jennifer Levy, who were integral and instrumental in overseeing this entire process. And now, my friends, I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Uh, Shimon Pro Professor from CNN. So yeah. I can see this already uh, developing from the president and certainly the Republicans who are going to say that you're only going after the NRA because of their support of him and because of their support uh, of the Republicans. How would you respond to, to that? By no means. This was an investigation that started in 2019 until this day. It's based on the facts. We follow the facts and the law, and we come to conclusions of law. And as a result of that, We've come to the conclusion that the NRA, unfortunately, was serving as a personal piggy bank to four individual defendants. And if I could just follow up, why call, you know, this is, as you said, a very powerful organization that's been around for so yeah. many years. This could not have been an easy decision uh, in some ways to, to come to. Why call for, the dissolve, for it to dissolve instead of just the removal of these people and try to keep this organization intact? Why is it that this organization now needs to basically go away. Because the corruption was so broad, and because of the level of waste, and because they have basically um, destroyed all of the assets of uh, the corporation. 
it was critically important uh, um, that uh, one of the causes of actions and one of the remedies that we are seeking is the dissolution of the NRA. Larry, you might start at the Associated Press. Okay. Uh, courts always look for prior precedents uh, to do something like this. Uh, what's the prior precedence that you would cite for dissolving an organization over fraud? So there are, there are two prior cases in the last couple of years. One is called the uh, multicultural, I'm, I'm, I'm not, multicultural um, Federation of Multicultural Programs out of Brooklyn. And the second is the Trump Foundation. In terms of criminal charges here, why are there no criminal charges and why are you, have you chosen to go to civil law? Um, the Office of Attorney General, particularly um, in regards to the not-for-profit law, is um, tasked with um, having jurisdiction over not-for-profits um, in the civil realm and not the criminal realm. Um, and that's why this is a, a civil enforcement action. If the NRA was to, oh, Megan Palin from the U.S. Sun, if you? the NRA was to be dissolved, what sort of effect or what would that mean for the wider issue of gun violence in this country? I know you've been uh, supportive and outspoken of uh, gun control before. So this um, has nothing to do with my personal opinion with regards to gun violence. This has to do with the fact that four individual defendants and the NRA as a corporation, unfortunately, did not follow not-for-profit law in the state of New York. And as a result of that, they should be held accountable. And that's why we seek their dissolution. We seek the banning of these four individual defendants. We seek restitution. Um, it's primarily because these individuals, unfortunately, did not follow the mission of the NRA. Down. Is this the moment that you've been waiting for? It's, it's not a question of a moment that I've been waiting for. This is a question, again, of following the facts and applying the law. And when you apply the law and you come to a conclusion, the only conclusion that you can come to is that these four individual defendants, as well as the NRA um, and all of its uh, directors and officers, violated the law. And they did it over a period of a year. And it went on unchecked for a period of a year. And uh, we came to the conclusion, based upon our thorough investigation, that enough was enough, and we needed to step in and dissolve this corporation, just as we did with the Trump Foundation. Just we'll take one more question in the room, and then we're going to go to the first floor. Do, do you have any concerns for your own safety, considering the NRA is such a powerful organization and does have so much support? Now, now that you're sort of leading this, do you have any concerns? None whatsoever. Okay, we're going to go to... Virtual call from my colleague Kelly will introduce the callers on the phone. Good afternoon. For the reporters who have joined us virtually for today's press conference, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen if you wish to ask a question. Our first question today will come from Danny Hakeem from the New York Times. Yeah, hi. Hello, hello uh, Attorney General. Hi, Danny. Um, do you anticipate uh, seeking or making a criminal referral in this matter? And would you rule out doing so in the future if you're not planning to do so now? This is an ongoing, but first of all, thank you for the question. It's an ongoing investigation. And if we un uncover any uh, criminal activity, we will refer it um, to the Manhattan District Attorney. But at this point in time, we're moving forward again in civil enforcement. Our next question will come from Tara Lenning of the Washington Post. Attorney General James, this is Carol Lenning. Thanks for your news conference. I have a question about your findings regarding um, LaPierre's ability to avoid reporting expenses as personal income on his personal income taxes. Have you or will you refer that to the IRS? And do you believe he evaded personal income taxes in a pattern over several years? So I will not, uh, again, come to a conclusion on whether or not he violated the um, Internal Revenue Code. Um, we are in the midst of um, submitting our complaint to the IRS, and we will contact the IRS accordingly. Thank you. Our next question will come from Stephen Gandel from CBS. Hi, thanks very much for taking my question. So many people today were speculating that uh, the conference was going to be related to President Donald Trump. 
can you give us an update on any investigations you have of President Trump or the Trump Organization? The Manhattan DA has uh, reportedly received documents from Deutsche Bank. You have also subpoenaed Deutsche Bank. Have you? Have they complied with your subpoena? And if so, can you give us a sense of what they've uh, given you? Thank you for that question, which is not the subject of today's press conference and will not comment on any other investigation. Thank you. Our next question will come from John Campbell from Gannett News. Hi, Attorney General. Uh, the, the Trump Foundation lawsuit, which uh, you know predated you here, it, it resulted in a settlement. Are you open to any sort of settlement talks with the, the NRA that, that would result in anything less than, than dissolution of the organization? Um, thank you for the question, and, and it is not um, my habit to negotiate um, any resolution in public. Um, we have filed our complaint today. Um, there are 18 causes of action. They include but are not limited to the dissolution of the NRA in its entirety. Our next question will come from Mark Merrimont from the Wall Street Journal. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Attorney General, thank you so much for the time. Sure. I was wondering uh, if the, um, uh, since you're seeking to dissolve this organization, is it possible that uh, that this could lead to uh, some kind of a tit for tat? In other words, conservative attorney generals and other states might take some kind of an action like this, uh, or is it possible that the NRA could say, "Okay, if you want to dissolve us, then we'll just move to Wyoming or Oklahoma, and you know, uh, now we're done with New York." In other words, you no longer would have power over the over this organization. I'm not going to speculate um, as to the future plans of the NRA. Um, the NRA, again, was formed under the not-for-profit laws in the state of New York. And as a result, the Office of Attorney General has supervisory jurisdiction over all not-for-profits, including but not limited to the NRA. Our next question will come from Eric Larson of Bloomberg. Uh, yes, hello. Um, the allegations that you've laid out here um, suggest that the NRA donors and members here were really essentially victimized, allegedly, uh, by these actions. And it, is it not further victimizing them by uh, forcing their, uh, you know, their organization to close uh, an organization that's pretty popular across the whole country? Um, is, that, is that necessarily fair to these victims here? The, it's, the issue is the following. A number of donors have contributed to the NRA because they believe in their mission. At this, at this point in time, the NRA right now is um, financially is in a, it's in a deficit. Um, and as a result of four individual defendants who have basically looted its assets. And so one would think um, that the donors uh, would like for an organization to have some governance, some standards, um, some uh, standards of behavior, um, and that they would recognize their fiduciary duty uh, to a uh, not-for-profit and or its mission, as opposed to looting, um, a, uh, looting assets and using it for their own personal benefit and or and their family. Okay, so our next question will be Jesus Garcia from El Diario. Hi, thank you. Thank you, General Attorney. Do you find that part of that money was used in political campaigns? If yes, which one? Um, so that is uh, not a subject of this uh, press conference today, um, but I do want you to know that our investigation is ongoing. Thank you. Our next person will be Henry Rosoff from PIX11. Well, Attorney General, thank you for taking my question. Um, I was just wondering if you could walk us through the next couple of immediate steps with the understanding that this type of legal action can take years. What will we see in the coming weeks and months? So I'm confident that there will be a response that will be filed uh, by the NRA. We will go through a series of motions. There will be discovery. Um, it's a normal course of action in all of our cases. Um, and so we will continue to keep you abreast of the status of this litigation. 
our next question will be from Victoria Tempest from the New York City Quotes Media. Hi, Attorney General James. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, many have criticized uh, the settlement your office brokered with the Weinstein Company, maintaining that the sum would have been greater if Weinstein personally had to pay into it. At any point during the settlement process, did you consider or advocate for Harvey Weinstein paying into the settlement? And if not, why not? So that's not the subject of the press conference here today. Uh, we will be providing, giving you an update in regards to the Weinstein uh, negotiations. And I thank you for the question. We have time for two more questions. Our next question will be from Paul DiRienzo from WBAL. Okay, just let me, uh, thank you very much for your uh, taking this call, Attorney General. My question is, uh, will you attempt to freeze the assets of the targets of this investigation or of the NRA or in any way try and prevent them from doing business uh, during this investigation? That is one of the remedies that we are seeking um, under, under um, our, in our pleadings. And so we look forward to, again, doing um, investigation to determine whether, where, if there are any hidden assets and whether or not they can be frozen, for the, again, for the purposes of benefiting those donors who have given to the NRA over the, over the years um, for um, the, its intended mission. Thank you. And our last question today will be from Sonia Moog from the CNN. Hi, Attorney General. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, it's actually a two-parter. One, um, it seems like there's a lot of allegations of uh, potential tax fraud here. Has this been reported to the IRS? And two, um, why take the measure to dissolve the entire organization instead of just removing these members? Can you speak to why that was necessary in this case? We thank you for those questions that were previously um, asked and answered, but we will answer them again. Uh, we will be forwarding the complaint to the IRS and we'll be in touch with the IRS in regards to any violations of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and uh, two, uh, because of the numerous complaints and, and, um, and based upon the facts and the application of law, uh, we concluded um, that the best way to um, address this matter was to seek resolution um, before a uh, New York State Supreme Court judge. And that is what we are seeking, again, given the breadth and the depth of the corruption, the illegality, um, and the brazen attempts uh, to basically uh, evade the law. I thank you all for coming. All right, we have been listening to the uh, Attorney General of New York uh, announce, her name is Letitia James, announce a lawsuit against the NRA. S she is seeking uh, the dissolution. She wants the nonprofit organization dissolved, and she is alleging that both current and a couple of former executives essentially used the uh, accounts of the NRA as their own personal slush fund, spending so lavishly that they have spent the organization into debt. She's accusing them of wasting $64 million on lavish vacations, uh, private transportation, expensive clothes, really expensive meals, not just for them, but also for their family members. And uh, amongst the people that she has listed is the current CEO, Wayne Lapierre. So let us get into this. We want to bring in uh, CBSN legal analyst Rebecca Royfe. Rebecca, you are joining us on the phone right now. Um, so let's talk about this. What she wants to see, what the AG says she wants to see, is the organization dissolved. Is this sort of the strongest action she could take? And she was asked whether or not there was, there was precedent. And uh, one of the attorneys included the case against the Trump organization as part of the precedent for them to move forward. Right. I mean, you know, it is um, dire to um, ask for the dissolution of an organization. But as she said, if the um, fraud and corruption is so widespread throughout that organization, it's not unprecedented. I think it's slightly problematic. And you could hear that in the question and answers when one of the recent precedents is the Trump organization, because part of the problem is Letitia mm. James, when she ran for attorney general, suggested that she was going after the Trumps, which made her sound less 
impartial than an attorney general really ought to sound. And so when she comes down with this, and she said all the right things, we're following facts, we're following law, but there's some concern that this is going to come across as a political vendetta. And I think, you know, that's concerning. It certainly sounds from the facts like that is not what this is. But, um, you know, you can see why people might um, have that in the back of their minds. Mm -hmm. Now, explain something to me, and this might be sort of basic, basic legal stuff 101 that I'm kind of unsure of. Um, this is a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit being brought by the New York AG. We're also hearing that the attorney general in D.C. is pursuing or has announced something very similar. But this is a national organization. So should they lose in the state of New York or in the District of Columbia, I mean, does the organization go away or just its assets in a particular location? Right. Um, that's a very good question. So it's, it, you know, this is an organization that is, um, as, as Attorney General James said, organized um, under New York's charitable laws. But that isn't the only state mm. in which the um, organization has a presence. So um, the, certainly this particular action will take a blow um, on the NRA, in part because just defending the lawsuit will take huge amounts of resources. So even if it's only dissolved in New York and while standing, I think, uh, mm -hmm. so I think, Rebecca, you're cutting out a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, if you can hear me, I'm just going to sort of bring people up to speed a little bit, and uh, maybe wherever you are, you'll sort of drive into a, a better cell area. <laughs> I but will, I will, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, we can actually hear you better now. No, that's good. That's okay. good. Okay. I'm sorry. So okay. can you just repeat sort of the last 30 seconds of what you said? Absolutely. So what I was saying is that um, it, part of the reason why the um, New York Attorney General has jurisdiction over this case is that the NRA is registered as a charity in New York under New York's laws. But as you said, it's a national organization, so it's registered um, in multiple states. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire organization would um, go out of business, would go down. But when you think about the resources that would have to be spent to defend against this allegation, that itself could destroy an organization. And I think that's, um, you know, that's a significant part of what's going on here. Yeah, in fact, according to the lawsuit, uh, what they're alleging is that um, the NRA had a surplus of $27.8 million in 2015, um, but all of that is gone now thanks to $64 million in excessive spending, putting, right. um, the, um, putting the organization in the hole to the tune of many, many millions, um, over $30 million, if, if, if that's uh, accurate. Listen, I also want to read this out. We have a bit of a statement from the NRA. Um, this is from the NRA president, Carolyn Meadows. This was a baseless, premeditated attack on our organization and the Second Amendment freedoms it fights to defend. You can have, you can, uh, and she goes on to say, you could have set your watch by it. The investigation was going to reach its crescendo as we move into the 2020 election cycle. It's a transparent attempt to score political points and attack the leading voice in opposition to the left, leftist agenda. Uh, this has been a power grab by a political opportunist, a desperate move that is part of a rank political vendetta. Our members won't be intimidated or bullied in their defense of political and constitutional freedom. So it's uh, basically she's suggesting what you identified as something that be could be seen as a problem, that the current AG in New York, uh, you know, as part of her campaign to run for that position, promised to investigate um, the nonprofit status of the NRA. Mm -hmm. um, this seems a little different. It's, it doesn't seem like she's talking about the nonprofit status, um, but, but perhaps it is. Um, and so, you know, there you're hearing sort of a little bit of the way the NRA is at least defending itself publicly. What would their legal defense possibly be? I know it's probably a hard question to answer. Right. I mean, this well, point. no, 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 it, it, it actually isn't because this is a, this is a garden mm -hmm. variety fraud um, allegation. And so the victims mm -hmm. here, I mean, she made this point, but really it's, it's important to make it because I think they're absolutely right to point to this concern about political 
vendettas and how the law should not be recruited in somebody's, you know, effort to destroy a political opposition. That is absolutely 100 percent true. But it doesn't look like that's what's happening here, because actually the victims are the members of the NRA. So if she can point to she can put together um, the facts to support these allegations, then really we really we are not talking about a political vendetta, regardless of what her motives may have been going in or when she was elected. It looks like she would be saving, the, you know, serving the people who are the donors to this organization, not undermining them, because no individual who gives money to a cause wants to have that money looted by certain individuals for their own private use. So the while yeah. they can use this as a um, as a poli- as a political public statement, they can't use it as a legal statement. Their their legal their legal defense is going to have to focus here on the facts, and they'll have to dispute the specific charges that these individuals were using money that belonged to this charity for their own personal use. If they can defend on the facts, then they win, and if they can't defend on those facts, then they lose. And it, it really it's such a shame that this narrative of political partisan corruption of the law is so easy to marshal now because it doesn't look like that's what's going on, at least not from the from 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 the statement itself. I mean if you look at the facts and it turns out not to support those allegations, then I'm then I would be the first to say. But it, it you know, as long as she can support those allegations, this doesn't look like a political case. Mm-hmm. Uh, CBS and legal analyst Rebecca Royfe, thanks so much for jumping on the phone so quickly. Uh, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Nice speaking with you, Amory. Good speaking to you as well. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, but the president spoke uh, not too long ago. We're getting that uh, video turned around for you so we can bring it to you. Take a little bit of a breathe- breather. You are watching CBSN, CBS News, always on. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's recording. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness